We're going to try and liven this up a little bit. We're going to make this a highly, in absence of the caffeine, we're going to try and make this session very lively. I'm warning you a little bit that Josh and I, when we get together, uh, the sparks start to fly. So this is, I'm not an academic, I'm not from your world, so I don't know the, the cultural protocols. We're going to have a discussion today about China, Africa. You're privileged to have the opportunity to hear from Josh, who is really one of the veterans of the business. He and I both started in this space uh, more than a decade ago, long before it was fashionable. China-Africa relations, in many ways, is one of the least understood of China's international engagements, but among the most important. Africa is a theater for the Chinese, where they go to do experiments and pilots and to do things that they can't do in any other part of the world, whether that's in economics, in trade, in diplomacy, in education, or, as we're going to find out today, in the political, military realm as well. So, Today's discussion is going to be about Professor Eisenman's new book that is going to be coming out from Columbia University Press. That is a huge accomplishment, from what I understand in the academic world. So uh, <laughs> um, let's, we're going to, you know, before we get into the nitty gritty of it, I think it's important that we acknowledge uh, the role that Ambassador David Shin played in the book. Uh, that was your co author. For those of you who are not familiar, Ambassador David Shin is also one of the greats in the China-Africa space. He's a former ambassador to Ethiopia and Burkina Faso from the United States. Uh, and he's been a, a really provocative thinker in this space. So the fact that you were able to partner with him is an amazing accomplishment. Let's start very quickly that most people, when they think of the China-Africa relationship, let's think of what comes to mind. Resources, trade, neo-colonialism, imperialism. These are the, the words that if we had a, a word cloud that you would see when you, uh, you know, debt, debt trap. Most of the themes of the China-Africa relationship in the public perception today are economic. You and Ambassador Shin, though, decided to do a book on political and military ties. Let's start there. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, for those of you who know this space, Eric is kind of the rock star of this space. He's running one of the most important podcasts. He's interviewing Chinese, Africans, Americans, Europeans, everywhere around. And now he's branching out to the Global South as well. So I'm privileged to be here sitting next to him. Uh, it's the Mutual Admiration Society. Here. Um, but, you know, one thing I can start off by saying, and I will get to your question, is that I've noticed over time that there's uh, a difference in the way that people who study Africa and maybe Africans, broadly speaking, and I'm, 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 I'm speaking very broadly here, see China and Africa, and those of us, like myself, who study China and China's engagement with the world. And I would broadly say that um, the people who are Africanists and who are from Africa see China as one of maybe the latest group of foreigners to arrive on the continent. And so they look at things in a comparative context. Well, the Chinese compared to the French, the Chinese compared to the Americans, the Chinese compared to the Russians, etc. And then they say, well, who's better, who's worse? Um, and this goes to something that uh, Yunnan was saying earlier about giving options, right? Who's our best option uh, out there? But for those of us, um, and, and I include you in the mix, who study China, we tend to look at China-Africa relations as a subset of China's engagement with the global south or the developing world, um, as it used to be called, or the third world, or whatever we're calling it these days. And then that, China and the global south, so China-Africa is part of China and the global south, China and the global south is part of China's geostrategy at large. And so we tend to ask the question, this is us who's looking at China, what is China doing in Africa, and how does that reflect its strategy in the world? And so this is just a different perspective. Now, working with Ambassador Shin, which is an honor, and this is our second book working together. Our first book, which was published in 2012 by the University of Pennsylvania Press, I'm thrilled to tell you, was translated into Chinese by the Chinese University of Hong Kong Press. And if you can guess who it was translated by, it was translated by that wonderful gentleman, Professor Wang Guan Yong, in the back. And so, this book, I'm proud to say, is the only book published in the People's Republic of China that is an uncensored book about China and Africa. It is 100% uh, uh, translated. There is no, you know, the governor of Taiwan. No, you know, we, we, we translated it robustly. And so this is then, to get to your question, building off of that approach, which was a whole of China-Africa approach. In the first book, we looked at China's engagement across the entire spectrum. Trade, aid, investment, politics, uh, security, 
And in 2011, when we finished the book, such an examination was possible. But as you know, as well as anyone, Eric, we have had a ballooning of the field, such that if one were to try to write that book today, it would be a multi-volume, it would, could fill this room full of paper because it's so... So one of the reasons we decided to look at this was because we needed to narrow our scope and focus it more. The second reason, and this is uh, 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 maybe a baseball analogy, I don't know how many baseball fans we have here in Israel, but you, uh, Ted Williams, the great baseball player, once said, you gotta hit them where they aim. Right? We gotta hit them where they aim. And the point is, if everybody is running to do the economics, and I'm not an economist, and neither is Ambassador Shin, well then you should study the things that other people aren't studying. So when we began to do this, when we first began this project in 2016, we noticed that there was a significant gap in the literature, because as you say, people were very much looking at the economic side of the equation. Ambassador Shin is an expert on the security side of the equation, I'm a political scientist. I've had 20 years of engagement with the International Department of the Communist Party of China through the American Foreign Policy Council, and I study the Communist Party of China's foreign policy writ large. So this gave us not only to hit them where they aim, but hit them where we live, which is we work on that stuff. And so we thought we brought comparative advantage, and we thought that that was a relatively empty space. Now, in the intervening period, more has been written about this, but that has only helped us because what has been written is not as robust as I might like it to be. And so we've been able to build on that growing literature, and my hope is that this book is a kind of crescendo, if you will, of that discussion. And therefore, the, the China-Africa political and security relationship, which is growing rapidly and growing kind of um, beyond our sight, right? The economics, as Professor Wong showed us, we can, that's what we can see. That's the part of the iceberg that's above the water but the politics and security that tends to live under the water. And so we try to shed light on that part. Okay, well let's go there. Um, what are we missing? What are we not seeing that you found in your research that I'm sure people in Washington and other capitals are going to be very interested to find out? What did you reveal in the research that, put, that went into this book? Because now when I say you have to buy the book, now. <laughs> so we, what we did is we, we, we looked at a variety of different elements of the China-Africa Paul Mill relationship. The political security relationship. Now, I, as the, the, the China China side of the equation, and the guy who's not as steep in the security, my work in the book is primarily focused on the Communist Party's role, the, the, the uh, international diplomacy aspects, the propaganda work that we're seeing. I have a report coming out from USIP, the U.S. Institute of Peace, next month, full report on China China's uh, uh, propaganda work in Africa, and that's a chapter in the book as well. And so. Some things I think we're not necessarily appreciating, I would say first, propaganda is not just media propaganda. For China, propaganda is also educational propaganda, right? The Confucius Institutes, etc. Um, it's also cultural propaganda. You know, those acrobat troops that are going, or you were going around Africa, they're not doing that because they like to do acrobatics. That's their job. They're, they're part of the party state apparatus to enhance the way that Africans view China, right? And, and so there's a, a whole set of cultural and what China likes to call people-to-people -people engagements, but what are really party-to-people engagements, that we either see what we want to see or see what we're used to seeing and say, okay, this is just like this, but it's not. It's, it's party-driven. Um, and so we shed light on that. We shed light on the role that the Communist Party of China's international department ha uh, is playing in terms of building relations with African political parties. And they're doing this around the world, but in Africa they've got an amazing group of partner parties that work with them across the ideological spectrum. Left to right, Islamist to secular, you name it, the Communist Party of China's International Department will engage you. Now, that's not to say that they don't have an ideology or an ideological game. They will engage anyone, but that doesn't mean that they are not in themselves having some kind of agenda. Right, so I would say these are two important things. Um, in addition, we look at security aspects, including the role of AI, the role of um, the role of uh, African uh, uh, collaboration, uh, military diplomacy between the African militaries and the Chinese military. Um, the People's Liberation Army is docking all around Africa in different ports. And I'll give you one anecdote. We are in Ghana, in the People's Liberation. Uh, PLA Daily newspaper, they had an article about how these ships were docking in Ghana. But in Ghana, it, it wasn't even in the press, and nobody knew it was even happening. 
right? So we've got a, a kind of whole level of mill-to-mill -mill cooperation and arms sales, etc., that are going along with it, which are almost unseen by most of us. And we've really tried to shed light on that and try to uh, elucidate that. There's a, I mean, there's a whole variety of security issues that we can unpack. So, so one of the things, if you've been following the news over the past, say, two or three months, is the the colossal meltdown in Washington about the presence or possibility of Chinese military bases in different parts of the world. This first started in Equatorial Guinea, where the United States uh, Africa Command commander, General Stephen Townsend, said that Equatorial Guinea he wants to uh, is open to hosting a Chinese base. Uh, it then moved to my neighborhood in Southeast Asia with the uh, with the Cambodians, and there's a freak out about the fact that the China the Cambodians might be building a base for the Chinese. And then now recently in the South Pacific on the Solomon Islands. China is the largest navy in the world. It's the second largest economy in the world. It is, uh, it is, it is a superpower by any definition. The United States government continually says it does not want to impede China's growth. It does not want to block. It does not want to contain. But yet every time China sets up a, or has a conversation with a country in Africa, even in Djibouti where that base is, uh, there is a panic. Um, how do you reconcile that those two positions from the United States and Europe also as well on China's mil legitimate military interests in other parts of the world? Well, I think that in order to understand the evolution, we have to step back a little bit. And when you and I began studying China-Africa relations, if you were to walk into the office of somebody who studies Chinese foreign policy, and you were to say, in 12 years or whatever, China's going to have a military base in Djibouti, they would say, you are a China threat theorist, and you don't uh, understand China because this is not Chinese policy. We will never have overseas military bases. That's imperialism. Well, that has evolved, right? And so you mentioned the base in Djibouti, which was, I think, their first overseas military base. And to date, base. they're only, as, as, as what we know. Now, see, this is always questionable, right? If you're building, like, the base in uh, what are there have been PLA ships that have docked there. Is that a base? I don't know. What is the definition of base? But yes, as far as I understand, that is the only Chinese overseas military base. And Ambassador Shin and I, in our field work, we visited Djibouti, and we, we talked to it, people about this issue. Um, and there have and been what did they say? What did, you were at Camp Le Manier in yes. Djibouti, yes. which is Camp Le Manier is the U.S. military base. And for those of you who want to get a sense of the geography of Djibouti, if you think Israel is small, Djibouti is much smaller. Israel is a giant country compared to Djibouti. There is probably what? The, the, the distance between the bases is less than a mile? I mean, it's very close. And there are also, uh, we should say, at many other foreign military so, bases in Djibouti. Japan, uh, Italy, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and France. And France. So, so China joined that club, right? I guess the difference with China, and, and, and Yunnan knows perhaps better than I, is that Djibouti has like 80% of its debt with China. Right, so Djibouti is one of these small handful of countries that really is up to its nose in debt to China. Okay? And so when you combine the economic and the security issues, you can imagine there's a great deal of Chinese influence. Right? Now, I think that... I will challenge you on that. I think Djibouti has the upper hand on this. And I think the Washington consensus on the debt in Djibouti is China can control Djibouti. Djibouti has the one thing that China doesn't have, which is real estate, location, location, location. And they're going to say, you know, the family's not going to pay back the debt. They, they're going to say, you don't want to pay? We're not paying back the debt. If you don't like it, you can leave. And they're never going to leave. So, so getting to your point, what is the U.S. concern? Right? Yeah. So what happened in Djibouti that we know? We know that, as far as, I mean, I think we know, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, from that base, the Chinese uh, uh, folks were aiming lasers at the eyes of U.S. pilots uh, who were... The Chinese deny it, but go ahead. They, they, yeah, they, be fair here. They're, they're just uh, uh, vocational training in Xinjiang as well. In case we did, right? So there's a lot of denials. But the truth is that I believe that those lasers were being focused in our interviews at Camp Le Manier. They were very clear about it. And they, to my, I'm satisfied that they were. Right? Um, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for. That doesn't suffice it for me. So ultimately, this can show you some of the concerns, right? To have the Chinese military base in such proximity to the U.S. and its allies, to be able to have um, signals, uh, intelligence, and other kinds of intelligence collection activities that close to U.S. military assets, I think it's a concern that is uh, realistic. 
Um, now the Chinese say that they put the base there because they're afraid of piracy. And maybe initially that was the case. But that piracy, as I understand, has more or less subsided. But yet the base remains. And so it seems that uh, this is a kind of, a, maybe a canonical case, it's the only case. But it shows why they're concerned about the west coast of Africa. Because what they see in Djibouti has already led them to be concerned about this issue. So the last thing they do is want more of this. Uh, so the, the piracy that Josh was talking about was part of the multinational uh, anti-piracy coalition that was the European Union, NATO, the United States, and others off the coast of Somalia. It's been five years since there's been a pirate incident, so the, the Somalia has said we don't want the multinational troops there anymore in the piracy. So if it's not piracy, uh, it faces out onto the Gulf of Aden, it faces out onto the Indian Ocean, it has convenient access to the Gulf into the Suez Canal. What is the purpose today of the base and going forward? Well, again, okay, I want to hasten to add that, uh, you know, I don't, of course, don't work for the Chinese government. No, but they may based on your research, way. what did you find? But, um, okay, so our good friend, Andrea Giselli, has written a book about China's military engagement in Africa and in the Middle East. And I think a lot of it comes down to uh, what we saw in 2011 in, in Libya, where you had thousands of Chinese and a lot of Chinese interests which came under threat, and the Chinese response was slow, it was delayed, it, was, it wasn't exactly... Um, you know, as robust as they would have liked it to be, and they ended up, I think, having to use cruise ships and other things to, 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 to change things. Maybe something similar happened in Yemen, yeah. in Yemen as well. So as China's economic interests have grown, so has its desire to protect those economic interests. Similarly, as Chinese people, more of them, have moved to Africa and become more engaged on the continent, protecting those people has also become important in that we require some level of assets. And, the most popular Chinese movie in the history of Chinese movies is Wolf Warrior II, which is about Chinese people, Chinese military assets in Africa, right? Um, and of course, the bad guys are a bunch of Americans who you know, need to be, it, it's very much a kind of Rambo approach. Um, so we've been there. Good fun, the movie. Um, I couldn't get through it. Let's, uh, let, let's transition to a, a different topic. The, the Chinese are, they always love to tell the fact that they are the largest contributor of peacekeepers among the P5 countries. Uh, in Africa, more of their peacekeepers are on the ground, mostly in humanitarian support roles, medical, engineering, uh, tech support and whatnot. But uh, there have been two deployments. Again, I said at the beginning that Africa is a testing ground for China. Uh, they've deployed armed, uh, for the first time anywhere in the world, armed uh, blue helmet soldiers under, P under UN command from the PLA to South Sudan and then they, they deployed People's Action Police forces into Mali as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about the multinational component of the Palm Bay relationship. Okay, now I have to be modest here and tell you that Ambassador Shin is really maybe the world's great expert on this, which is why I'm so privileged to work with him. But I, I should hasten to add that, to my knowledge, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, the P5, while we, especially the US, is the number one financial contributor, right, so we're paying, uh, we are not necessarily deploying troops. We're in our beers, though, but we're paying. Okay, we're paying. Uh, the uh, other UN member states, which are not P5 members, have contributed more troops than China. So okay. It's specific among the P5. Yeah. But, in, but in terms of the UN General, General Assembly, I'm not sure exactly where they rank. It may not even be in the top five in terms of contributors. So we have to add this important caveat to the discussion. Um, but, you know, the, the Chinese... Uh, People's Liberation Army's uh, contribution to this, I think it has a variety of aspects. One of them is, you know, it's good public diplomacy, right? We've got our blue helmets on, we're keeping peace and security, we're doing good work. But also, we'd be fools if we didn't notice there's an intel collection aspect of this, right? And there's a best practices aspect of this. When you're working with foreign militaries, you can learn from them, you can learn about them, um, you can learn what's going on on the ground. And we would be, uh, I think, remiss if we didn't think that Plenty of intel is being funneled back into the Bai Dalo, so the, the, the Chinese Pentagon, uh, from these peacekeepers. Now, this is not to detract from the contribution that they make to peacekeeping, but we also have to understand that Chinese peacekeepers have a multifaceted uh, responsibility, shall we say. What do you think of the idea that China has not fought a war since the Sino Vietnamese War in World War 1978 1979? And so, in a conflict, with the United States or any of its neighbors, which pick your neighbor, and there could be any number of them. Um, they don't have command and control experience. They don't have combat experience. They don't have logistics experience. 
and we're seeing now in Ukraine the importance of logistics. Um, to what extent do you think the deployments in places like South Sudan or Iran are a safe place to get that experience of on the ground, under put your your sergeants and your commanders under some real life action situations to then apply elsewhere? I mean that I think that's true. I think that's right. Um, now, and again, Ambassador Shin knows more about this than anyone, but I, I believe in Sudan they ran into some problems at times, right? And they did take some casualties, and this was a learning lesson. And they didn't come, well, what happened is they, there was an attack on the base, and they all hit at the base, and they were scared. Now, they deny this. They say we weren't, but the locals say that when, they, when the attack came, they, they hit on the base. That was a long time ago. Since then, they have been engaged in combat. I mean, I guess one could ask the question, if we think about where China is most likely to be engaged uh, in the security aspect, I think we have to agree that Taiwan is the primary, and then elements of the South China Sea and along the Indian border. And one could ask the question, how much value is training your troops in Sudan to a Taiwan invasion, or how much is it, uh, how effective is it to the fighting on the top of the Himalayan mountains uh, with clubs and sticks, as we saw, um, and the answer is pretty little, I think. And so, to my mind, there is limited application for a lot of these deployments for actually Chinese efforts to achieve their revanchist goals. So, um, I, you know, it's good to have some on-the-ground experience, but you should want your on-the-ground experience to be relevant. Um, but I, I guess this is just what they, this is the experience they can get, because this is where the blue helmets are. Let's shift from the military into your expertise in the political. Um, when China first went to Africa in the early 2000s under Hu Jintao, it was very much to secure resources and provide opportunities for state-owned enterprises and to even at some point export labor and jobs and all of that. Uh, and that was prior to the Belt and Road. So most of what China was buying from Africa, they weren't buying elsewhere, oil, mineral, and timber. Uh, did, uh, Professor Sh Ambassador Shin has a great statistic, which I absolutely love, that in 2008, 30% uh, of, Af of Chinese oil was imported by three African countries, Cameroon, uh, the Republic of Congo, Angola, and Sudan. Sudan of, of, their imports. of their imports. 2018, uh, that number's down to 8%, and Angola's the only one in the top 10. So the economic relationship has shifted. The political relationship has gotten way more important today. Tell us the paradigm of the political relationship as it is today. Let me start with that trade point you made. Um, China is not only engaged in oil, and, but they're also deeply involved in minerals, timber, fishing is a really big part of what they're doing. So, it, so simply because they moved away from oil doesn't mean they're not heavily involved in the resources, which I do believe, and I haven't looked at the statistics, and Professor Wang knows the statistics almost at hand, but still make up the vast majority of China's imports from Africa are raw materials of some 70%. 70%, right, so you have them on hand as well. So even if it's not oil, it's something else. But to me, the biggest problem with the trade relationship is how amazingly unbalanced it is in almost all countries in Africa. And when I talk about imbalance, I mean, hey, I'm from the US, we know China trade deficits, right? We, we you know, we're, we're the, the OG of China, Africa, China trade deficits. We, But even our trade deficits are nothing compared to Kenya, are nothing compared to Djibouti, um, you are nothing compared to Ethiopia. In these cases, you're dealing with, of the total trade, 95 plus percent are Chinese imports, right? Uh, and and the, the other, you know, you look at Ethiopian exports to China, it's like goat skins and sesame. Well, that ain't gonna do it. And so it becomes a political issue, as it has in our country, right? The, the trade issue, when it goes on long enough, when you have sustained ongoing trade deficits, people notice that, it has a hollowing out effect, and it impacts the domestic politics in ways that are negative, and negative for China's image, and negative for the, for the, for the relationship. Um, so, yeah. There's a lot of frustration, though, in the outside world, because they're not paying attention to that. In the outside world, particularly in the US and Europe, they're accusing African governments of, in the Ukraine war, of the word now is fence sitting. Um, they accuse the uh, many African, a number of African governments are Muslim majority, and all African governments uh, have, have sided with China on contentious issues like Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong. Not very few. Eswatini is the only one because they recognize Taiwan. Um, and so there's a frustration on the part of US diplomats and European diplomats as to why are these countries aligning themselves 
with what they perceive to be the biggest jerks in the world. <laughs> That's their perception. I mean, just to use impolite language. I mean, I guess this gets to this issue of the straw man of the debt trap diplomacy. Because from the Chinese perspective, if you will, it seems that if you engage somebody economically in a way that's beneficial for them, you create what in Chinese is our ren qing jai. So you create, they owe you one, right? And if they can't return it in economics, they have to return it somehow. And so how do they return the favor? They return it by voting with you in the UN, by signing onto the letter for the Uyghurs. Because if you do that, or not signing on the Chinese letter, to be clear, not, not on the Western letter, the, the, the African countries, uh, dozens of them, have supported China's policies in Xinjiang. Not, not just sat on the fence, they are on the record, right? Rwanda, Rwanda supports China's claims in the South China Sea. Okay? That's an easy giveaway, right? Nobody in Africa is inviting the Dalai Lama for dinner. And by the way, this gets to the kind of no strings attached. China has no strings attached in your country, but there are plenty of political strings attached if you violate what they consider their political interests, right? So invite the leader. So I, I have an acronym for this. This is fun. 4THKXJSC, okay? <laughs> work, work with me here. 4T, Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, the party. Those are the lines you can't cross. No, I can't use the. the. That's the way I squeezed in the party. Uh, HK is Hong Kong. XJ is Xinjiang. Uh, S is the South China Sea. And now we have a new one. The list, by the way, keeps getting longer. And that is COVID. So if you question the origins of COVID, you have crossed the red line. So those are the yeah. strings that are attached. No strings attached, except those strings that are attached. Just those strings that are attached. Yeah. But there are different kinds of strings, right? From the Western perspective, we don't care how you criticize the United States, per se. I mean, we, we care, necessarily, your human rights record at home, right? So our strings are about what's going on in your country. Their strings are about what they consider to be their country. So I think it's important to just differentiate in terms of where those strings are. Well, our strings are what you're doing in your country. So we give development aid on the condition of X, Y, Z, and that's what people find so offensive. Because governments say, you can't, in Africa, one of the big issues is LGBTQ issues in East Africa. Don't Kagame in Rwanda, uh, uh, Kenyatta in Kenya, all said, don't lecture us on LGBT issues. And we don't want your money if that's what it is. So getting back to the question that you asked about you know, the politics, you know, we've seen just an extended effort to cultivate African elites. This is the education sphere is one of them. You know, the, the, the scholarships that are given out, you know, if, if we at Notre Dame are going to give scholarships to African students, those students have to apply to Notre Dame, right? They come to us, they apply, we evaluate their application, and we give plenty of scholarships. At the Keogh School, most of our students are from the Global South. Let me repeat that. Most of the students who are pursuing MA degrees at the Geo School are from the Global South, and nearly all of them, I, I, I would say all, but I don't want to like you find one person. To my knowledge, all of them are receiving large subsidies, support from the University of Notre Dame. But the U.S. Embassy is not going to go over to you and say, do you want a scholarship to Notre Dame? But the Chinese Embassy is in the business of identifying elites in Africa and then providing them uh, scholarships, and, and, and our friend Cliff Omboya is a great example, right? Is that bad, what they're doing? I, I wouldn't say it's bad, it's just different, right? And it takes a little bit more of a self-starter to go out and apply to a bunch of schools in America and the hope and the prayer than it does to take a phone call and say, okay, we have a scholarship for you, okay, I'll take it, right? So it's a different approach, but I, I, I always remind African friends that we have a lot of support for you, you just have to ask for it. You've got to be proactive, whereas the Chinese side may seek you out and then try to provide opportunities strategically. And so I got my start in China-Africa relations in Nanjing, at Nanjing University, hanging out and going to clubs with Africans. And I can tell you, these are not poor Africans, right? These are not necessarily even the best and brightest, but they are extremely well-connected. They are elites, and they are, in many ways, cultivating their elite relations in China and building those relations with Chinese and with Africans and creating a guanxiong, like a, a, a relational circles that then can be useful later. Yes and no. One of the key problems, it's been 20 years now in the China-Africa relationship, since about 2003 to today. 
every year 62, 63,000 African students went to go study in, in China. Until COVID. Until COVID. Um, we've talked to people in Durko, the South African Foreign Ministry. We said, how many China experts do you have? Five. China Foreign Ministry. Ghana has two. Ghana has two. Uh, Kenya has, has one. Okay. African governments have been getting their clocks cleaned by the Chinese on contracts. In fact, the, uh, in, in, in Uganda, the finance minister testified before a parliamentary committee and said, we did not understand the contract. Okay, I gave a briefing to some African ministers, and I said, how come your capacity on China isn't higher? You have 50 to 60,000 well-trained, fluent-speaking Chinese. You know what they say? Not the right ethnicity, not the right tribe, not the right political party. If you're not ANC, you don't get into the South African government. So at what point does this become the African agency issue than it is the China issue? You know, the issue of African agency has been much discussed, right? And, and we're in a situation where if you ever say anything about the Africans don't have agency, well, then you must be like somehow stripping them of agency. Uh, but the reality is when you go into, as we did, an interview, the, P, the folks in Ghana who hold the China portfolio, no, they don't speak any Chinese. Yes, they work in a building built by China, right? That the building, the foreign ministry of Ghana, is built by China. And I, and I recall, uh, we asked them, we said, well, when the whole spying incident at the African Union happened, the Chinese also built the African Union headquarters, and then they set up all of these servers, which they were recording what was going on, and then this was all being downloaded to Shanghai at 2 in the morning, and Le Mans broke this story. And I said, well, what did you do? And they said, well, for several weeks while we swept the building, we held our meetings in a Starbucks. Right? That's not agency, I submit to you. If you're holding your meetings in the Starbucks, it's kind of hard to suggest that you are on equal footing uh, because I have to tell you, those people who are working in China, and, and there's dozens of them, who are amazing uh, at, at what they do and, and are, are good at it. And, they're, and as you've told me, they're hiring people from the most highest law firms and they're paying them well to negotiate those contracts. So, you know, there are systemic problems here, right? And it's very easy to say, well, if you did a bad contract, it's your fault. You had agency, you blew it. I don't, I don't necessarily see it that way. I see when you've got systemic inequity, systemic asymmetries, it's impossible to sometimes overcome those asymmetries in a way that produces results that are, are favorable. But Ghana's relationships with every country in the world is asymmetric because it's small. Its relationship with the United States is asymmetric. Its United relationship with Japan is asymmetric. China's not unique there. Let me tell you an anecdote that I thought was as we flew into Ghana, we were flying from uh, Ethiopia into Ghana, there was uh, three Chinese men sitting next to me. And they were trying to fill out their visa forms and having a hard time with it because it's in English and Amharic. And so I speak Chinese, so I said, well, can I help you? And they said, oh, thank you, please. And I said, well, okay, uh, according to the form, you know, what are you, what are you doing there? And they point to their visa. Their visa says tourism. I said, okay, what are you doing there? Gold mining. <laughs> okay. How long are you going to stay? I don't know, one or two years maybe. What's their visa say? Two months, tourists, mm -hmm. right? We get there, we land. Before we get to security, a Ghanaian comes around, takes these Chinese guys by the hand, and leads them in, right? So there is a kind of, uh, it's, again, I, could any of us imagine this happening in China? Could we imagine three Ghanaians showing up in Ghana on tourist in, in China on tourist visas and going to Yunnan to, to mine jade ore. I mean, that's what I mean by asymmetry. I mean, at the very grassroots level, you have people but, who are conspiring but, to but, help. Yes, but to be fair, Nigerians are doing the same thing in Ghana, Lebanese are doing the same thing in Ghana, and Indians are doing the same thing in Ghana. It takes one to know. This is all, this is, the Chinese are not unique there by any stretch, but at the end of the day, the problem ultimately lies with the lack of Ghanaian governance than it does with the lack of the, the Chinese who are violating the system. And this gets to a really interesting thing that we, we, we found when we were in Ghana, which was, I did interviews with both uh, Ghanaian ruling, uh, the ruling party and the former ruling party. The, the former ruling party, their headquarters, where I met them, was built by the Communist Party of China, stocked by the Communist China. I mean, literally, Chinese companies built it and funded it, right? So they were very happy. 
And the NPP, which was then, had just come into power, I met them in a kind of really shabby building. There was one guy who was the entire international department of the party, not just for China, for the whole world. And this guy, he was very proud. He goes, look, you see this desk? The Chinese just gave it to me. See my new laptop? The Chinese just gave it to me. My brand new Huawei cell phone, my copier. And he just went through the office pointing and indicating each and everything that the Chinese embassy had provided him. And I said, and he had a Xi Jinping's uh, uh, book on his desk, right? This, this Xi Jinping uh, little white, or big white book, big white book. And, um, and so I said, you know, are you concerned that you're using this phone the Chinese embassy gave you that they may be listening to some of the things that you're saying? And he said, well, you know, let them listen. Right? And so that's what I mean by what, asymmetry. But that's what Paul Kagame said about the AU spying thing. He said, we should have built our own goddamn building. Sorry for the language. But that's exactly, those were his words exactly. If we didn't want to be spied on, we should build our own GD building. I mean, I, I guess when you, when you read the writings that the, the people in, in China talk about political parties, they see political parties as this essential node that touches every element of that society, every element of every policy. And so these are essential interlocutors. And the Communist Party of China isn't changing. It remains the ruling party of China. But in a place like Ghana, they've been amazingly successful at being able to work with both sides. And so whoever wins the election, they win. Right, that's the win-win, I guess, right? Um, and then in other places, like um, Ethiopia, however, and in the ANC in South Africa, I would argue that they face some problems because they went all in on the EPRDF, which was the former ruling party of yeah, Ethiopia. They trained them, that they had more exchanges with the EPRDF than any other ruling party in all of Africa. There was commentary that said, these are our quote, best students on the continent. And do we all know what happened to the EPRDF? They're gone. They're gone. And so, in many ways, China has been, and I know this sounds a little funny, more successful in Africa in engaging in democracies than it has in autocracies, where if you bet wrong, who knows? Okay, we have 20 minutes left. That's more than I, uh, that's less time than I wanted for questions, but you can see why the two of us up, and it just goes all night like this. There's a microphone there. How do we get that over to people? Let's take your questions. Uh, okay, who's got questions? Good job, man. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, during the past year, there was a discussion in the European Union to give certain favorable recognition to gas that was found in Africa. Uh, in other words, they could define it as green rather than as polluted or whatever. Uh, and the decision was supposed to be taken now, or early this year. I don't know what happened to it. That's my first question. In other words, what interests me is the whole question of the future of Africa as a source of whatever. Now, in, for example, as far as I know, there isn't one single uh, metal steel company in Africa other than in South Africa. Uh, on, on the other hand, China has the largest steel company in the world. So it would seem to me that the move could be and should be to create a steel company for green steel, if you like, in Africa. Use the raw materials that are there. Get tax exemptions and then welcome it. Just That's my point. question. Yeah, on the steel question, uh, I'll just update you. Um, Qingshan, which is one of the largest uh, mining companies and steel companies, is building a billion dollar steel plant in Zimbabwe. And Nigeria has a number of steel uh, factories as well. So South Africa is the main one, but you're, there is, it's, it's starting to grow a little bit, but not much. Uh, do you want to take any of those questions or any comments on that? You know, I, I have to be honest with you, we've focused so much on the security and the politics that some of the economic investments, uh, like you're talking about, we, we, we've, we haven't been focusing on it. So I, I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn, and I think there's been no So more. I'll tell you a little bit of the reaction, though, that I pick up on, on the continent from about the U.S. and Europeans on natural gas and oil. 
And this goes to the sermonizing, the lecturing. For the past five years, all we've heard is that Africa needs to transition, to just transition away from uh, hydrocarbons. And there's all these foundations, all these NGOs, all these governments pouring in money, telling African governments, you need to transition to green. Bear in mind, Africa contributes 3% to global climate emissions. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, uh, last month, comes rolling into Algeria. And what does he want? He wants gas for the white people. So all of a sudden, when Europe needs hydrocarbons, everything is fine. We, we, Africa's great, we want to buy up all your hydrocarbons. When Europe didn't need it, they didn't, they said you have to go to just transition. Germany, in particular, has been lecturing Africa on not using coal. South Africa in particular. And what are the Germans doing right now? They're going back to coal. The hypocrisy is shocking. And part of the reason why the Chinese have had such success in Africa is that Westerners underestimate the resentment, the bitterness, and the toxicity of the relationship with the West. The King of Belgium was just in the Congo and could not come to apologize for the horrific atrocities that were there. So, oh well. Um, so this is the this is part of the problem on the natural gas issue. It is filled with resentment on the part from out from many African stakeholders about the, du the dual policies that are there. So now, now, the what one do you propose? What's that? What do you propose? What can happen? What can you do? At least, and this is what I was, this is my big criticism of U.S. and European policy in general, is if you're going to live by values, live by values. If you're going to say green is important, then live by it. But when the United States is the largest fossil fuel producer in the world, more than the Saudis, and they're talking about just transition to Malawians, it, it doesn't resonate. I think the United States and Europe lack credibility on this climate change issue. Eric, I guess I guess where I would, I guess, I don't know if it's break ranks, but I would say this is a really complicated issue. I don't think there's anybody in Africa, Europe, or the U.S. who really would be like, oh yes, let's please burn more fossil fuels, right? I think we all agree that we want to move away from this, but we also agree that it's hard, that it's going to take time, and that there's going to be a lot of hemming and hawing and hypocrisies as we have to deal with the consequences of this transition. So, you know, I guess I... I, 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 mean, I, I disagree with you. People say if you were able to burn fossil fuels for your economic development, and in Nigeria, for example, where wood burning is a big problem, going up to coal and to gas is actually cleaner than wood burning. It's actually a progression. And if that's what produces economic development, then power is the number one problem in Africa today. But where, who is facing the consequences of climate change more than any? The global south, right? So. We can talk about what happened in the past and, and, and the British and the burning of coal, but where does that get us in terms of actually solving this problem? I'm not sure it does anything except for maybe, you know, well, the British did a lot of horrible things. And so did, you know, and so did the Americans, so did the French, so did the Chinese. But where does that get us in terms of not moving our thermostat <laughs> two degrees higher and those sea level rise? You know, and so I mean, I, I, I don't have any answers on this. And this is not really something we deal with in the book, to be honest with you. But I, I guess I think this is a much harder question than saying, oh, you're a hypocrite because now oil is $6 a gallon and so you're there. We live in a democracy. And in a democracy, you can get voted out. And so if the Communist Party of China has the ability to say, you know, we're going to handle higher oil prices, that we can deal with that, we can push through it, I guarantee you the, the Biden administration does not have that luxury given the, uh, the approval ratings that the guy's facing. So it's political. Who's got questions? questions? Anybody? Okay. The young man in the blue. Oh, uh, that's all right. We can okay. do both. We can do both. Okay. Here comes the hard one. I know. This is revenge. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, so, Josh, Eric, thank you so much. This is a great conversation. Um, I'm just curious, you know, the, the conversation about some of these things that China is doing, and I think Eric, you're asking really good, hard questions about, well, how is that different from what others are doing, you know, in terms of basin, or in terms of uh, going in and mining, and these kinds of things. And I think, you know, where I see the difference is, you know, what comes 
as part of that package, right? And so when we think about, for instance, this supposed deal that went down with the Solomon Islands around yeah. potential military base again, what concerned me most was not China's going to have a base, although that is concerning, and it certainly should be concerning for the Australians and others in that region. But it's more about the other parts of that deal that we saw about potentially China being able to send in you know, security services in order to protect stability in the situation there if you know if things got out of place. And of course, there was some pushback, though that's not exactly what it means. But I think there's good reason to believe that a lot of it's potential basing. This applies to Equatorial Guinea or anywhere else in Africa. What else comes with that in terms of what it means for the internal dynamics in those countries and the way in which China might put its finger on a scale to help you know, the, the resident autocrat to stay in power if it serves China's interest. So that's one part of the question. And the other is just the general back and forth on this notion of, well, um, China, African agency versus Chinese culpability. And I think that there's, I think there's plenty of reason to say, you know, African governments are at part to blame for what happens when they sign up to things that are not good for their people. But I don't think that that wipes away the, the Chinese culpability. It's like basically the Africans leaving the windows open and then the Chinese come in at night and, and steal something, right? I mean, that's what, whatever analogy you want to use. There's enough culpability to go around and then you add on to that. I don't know how to factor this into my house analogy, but you add into that the fact that, as we were talking about earlier, China's helping those governments to suppress their own civil society and their own independent media, that would be keeping those officials honest, right? So that, it's kind of some questions, but yeah. also comments. Well, I, mean, I, I think that what, what David and here is, is getting at is that, yeah, we'd like to think that stealing a penny is the same thing as stealing a billion pennies, but we all know that's not true. We all know that size matters. And that when you look at the impact of a large country, it's almost like a large planet. It changes the way in which the rest of the international community works. And so the way that China changes the interaction and provides technologies, Huawei, other things that are just beyond what would have normally been or what was ever really available, I think it's a game changer in a lot of ways. And it is empowering to people who would like to maintain the controls. Now, you know, if you ask an autocrat, if this information that we're, all the faces of your country were collecting on the facial recognition, it's going to go to you, but it also goes to Beijing. Are you okay with that? Maybe they would say, yeah, I'm okay with that, because it keeps me in power. No other country is going to make that deal. Right? That's a that's a something only China can really do. And so I think that we have to we have to recognize that the size, I, I, I mean I used to refer to it as the mothership. Right, of, to, of this kind of technology. Others may have it, but they don't, they're not game changers in the way that China is. Um, and, and so I think that's that's something we need to take into consideration because stealing a penny is not like stealing a billion pennies. Okay. It has size, and that's, that's important. We've talked a lot about the Chinese and autocrats, and I don't think that's entirely fair because you'll find that the, re the reception among democratic governments in Africa, Liberia, South Africa, Kenya, the biggest Democrat, Nigeria. Democrat elected politicians, what do they love to do no matter where they are in the world? Win they, elections. Yes, but how do you win elections? Whether it's in America or whether it's in Namibia, is you cut ribbons and you deliver goods. One of the things that the Chinese do better than almost anybody is that they will build something in 18 months in the term of a political leader. So what the research from Jude Moore at the Center for Global Development will tell you is that the popularity of the Chinese in de democracies is often higher than it is in autocracies who are not actually accountable to their people. And again, this is all, we can disagree with it, but democratic, democratically elected politicians like Uru Kenyatta, like Cyril Ramaphosa, love the Chinese because they deliver on the infrastructure, and that is to their administration and their campaigns. Very positive. Look, the U.S. isn't building infrastructure in the U.S., let alone in Africa. We have to, we have to be frank here, and one of the reasons is, and one of the reasons the Chinese, as, as you and I talked about, are moving away from it, is because railways are almost never money-making ventures. What they do is they synergize your economy so that your GDP may go up, but you may lose money on that railway. You may lose money on that highway. And so how do you convince a private investor to come in and build a railway when we can't even fix Amtrak yeah, because there's no money in it? Yeah, but to be right? fair, so to say that the Chinese no. are these, hold on, let me finish the sentence. To say that the Chinese are building infrastructure and we're not, and so they're good and we're bad, is to, is to I think, misunderstand that 
the, the nature of the economics of the United States. We have quarterly earnings reports. Joe Biden cannot come in and say, you're going to build this railway. You know who has to say that? The shareholders of that company. And if they say, uh, our new portfolio is building railways in Africa, what's going to happen to their stock tomorrow? Josh, but literally, that's what Biden is saying, though. That with B3W in the next week, they're going to launch. And it's not working. Launch it. And it's not working. But this, this straw man of, of railways losing money, I looked this up. The German National Railway was subsidized to the tune of 18 billion euros last year. SNCF was subsidized to the tune of 12 billion euros last year. And track railways, except in Japan, don't make money. And, and then you see this criticism coming in from Westerners to Kenyans about saying, you built a you know, white elephant, and the Kenyans will turn around and say, where is the profitable railroad in the world? Well, and, and, that's, and that's true. You need a railroad to move goods and people. If you are going to build something like this, what you're looking for is to enhance, from an economic perspective, you want to enhance the mobility, labor mobility, capital mobility within your society, which then causes you to have an increase in GDP growth. But it doesn't necessarily make the railway profitable, right? These are two different things. And I think, if I would guess, this is why the Chinese are moving to, I think, it, what was it, to small and beautiful, right? They're trying to move towards things which are profitable, um, and are not necessarily going to be necessarily lost leaders, but um, it, it helps when you have a, a, a name brand in that country, and you can build a name brand by building something that people take a recognition. They say, well, you did this, then you can do that, and then you can create a brand. But U.S. infrastructure companies, yes, they're not building in Africa. The exception to what Josh is saying is in Southeast Asia, where the Chinese are continuing to build massive railways into Vientiane, all the way down to Singapore, they're into Vietnam. No, 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 they're, built, they're extending all the way into Bangkok. They see the railways as kind of a clause that can hold into Southeast Asia. That's the only place in the world where they're building railways. And then, of course, China, it, you know, China cares more about Southeast Asia, in part because of the proximity and importance of, of Southeast Asia. I would say that these projects that you're talking about have long been in the works. And so my argument would be they're finishing what they had 10 years ago said, this is our plan. And uh, my, my old advisor, Mike Lampton, wrote a book about this uh, with some folks in Singapore about this project. I actually was the peer reviewer on the project, which is fun when you get to review your own advisor's proposal. And I let it go. Uh, okay, in the back. Hi, I'm Michael, and my question is about railway. When I was in South Africa in the 70s, China built the Tanzan from Dar es Salaam to the Copper Belt in Zambia because Zambia wanted to be less dependent on South Africa and Portugal and not to export via South Africa or Baira or Luanda. What is the status today of the, the Tanzan? I remember growing up in South Africa, there was a whole outcry that it's China preparing to invade South Africa, and the, the gauge of the railway was a unique Chinese gauge. Uh, what, what is the status today of this railway? So, I think that the major contribution of the Tanzan Railway was political, right? That it, that it said that, you know, the World Bank isn't going to do this, but we are going to do this, right? We are going to cut this railway through the jungle, and we are going to build this thing, even if even if the West says it's not viable. Well, guess what? It wasn't viable. My understanding is it didn't work very well, and it took, I don't even know if they've, yet, if they've still paid off the debt. I know China's written off. Or they've written it off. They've, they've, written, they've written it off, but it wasn't paid back. Okay, it was written off and written off decades later. What Ambassador Shin is fond of telling me is, we loved it as America because we weren't going to cut our way through the jungle, but we were more than happy to build a road next to that railway, which was functioning, even after the railway stopped functioning, that road was still effective. And I, I do believe there's been some rehabilitation efforts well, they just to the railway. They announced, Director General Wu Peng was in Lusaka, and they just announced they're going to upgrade the Tesar. Yeah, so, I mean, this, this is a very important political symbol of China saying to the West, you say no, but we are going to do it anyway. We will not follow your rules. And, and you know, and that's a very important kind of signaling effect on African interlocutors, right? That, that China is a very important other that they can work with. When the, when the World Bank says no, maybe China will say yes. But I think that this goes to the point earlier made that I don't know how much of that is in the works going forward. I think a lot of that may be 
in the past that small and beautiful may be their way and more technologically oriented, more high tech uh, driven rather than a kind of low tech infrastructure. I think they're more interested in 5G networks, they're more interested in the, the, the security networks and other more sophisticated technology um, where they do believe that a profit can be driven. And, and as I understand it, and Eric will always, he always tells me when I'm wrong, so I, I have faith. Um, but a lot of this is also to collect um, the data to improve their algorithms on the security side. So um, Chinese AI is very good at recognizing Chinese faces. It's pretty darn good at recognizing white faces. But to my knowledge, it's still not very good with African faces. And so you give Zimbabwe the security in, you know, network for free. What you get is to improve your algorithm with every face it collects such that you become the security provider on the continent and you improve your security uh, technology at the same time. It's a win-win. Okay, we have time for one last quick question. Does anybody have a quick question? Okay, if not, then we're going to get some final thoughts for you about the book, about when it's going to come out, and what's ahead. So, <clears throat> any of you who've worked with an academic press know that they, they run at the speed of the Tanzan Railway. Okay, so the we have, we, we're submitting the book to press in September, which means it's probably going to come out in like 2030. No, it's going to come out about nine months later, once they go through all of the rigmarole. We're through the peer review process, thankfully. The contract is signed. But now we've got to finish the process of updating the book according to what those reviewers have said, and academic reviewers who are hiding behind anonymity often have a lot of comments to make, as I see some nods in the audience here. Um, so we're going to update it, we're going to get it as good as we can, and then it's going to be out by this time next year, uh, that the book will be out. Um, and so, you know, please uh, buy it, and it's a stocking stuffer, right? Um, but we're really excited, though, because we see the entire field is moving towards higher quality research, right? Um, and we are thrilled to be part of that endeavor. And I believe this conference is part of that endeavor. You guys have just been privy to, to my mind, and I guess I'm self-interested, two of the best panels I've heard on this topic in the last three or four years. And I think we're going to hear it in the same in the afternoon. And so you can get a sense of the high quality of academic research that is now being driven that, in my opinion, was not happening even five or six years ago. And so we're thrilled to be part of that part of this wave of high quality research um, that, and, and then the new courses, et cetera, that are putting out. Just one data point. Last year, two years ago, I taught my course, China in the Developing World at Notre Dame. I had eight students. Last semester, I had 27. All right? So this, even while uh, China is seeming to pull back a little bit in terms of its uh, you know, tourism, et cetera, this is an issue that is more on the minds than maybe ever before. So you know, I guess that's the pitch. OK, thank you very much.